Hmm. Again, I find this very hard to believe. Nobody ever talks about Newtons. <laughs> Nobody ever says, hey, we're going to a party. Better pick me up some Newtons. You bring in the Newtons? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I got to... You know what? I'm meal prepping my lunches for work for, for, for the whole week. Better pack some Newtons. <laughs> forgot the Newtons today. <laughs> oh, you forgot your like, Newtons. <laughs> like, nobody, like... <laughs> said no one ever <laughs> like what was the last time you had a big movie welcome to theoretical nonsense the big bang theory watch along podcast no phd required we're the podcast that recaps all the episodes of the big bang theory no spoilers so hop into your favorite spot make yourself a grasshopper and, and enjoy, enjoy the, the ride, ride. Hello there, Ryan. Hello, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How about you? I'm doing great because we just watched season three, episode 10, The Gorilla Experiment. Oh, yeah. For any new listeners out there, I'm Rob. This is my co-host, Ryan. We are Theoretical Nonsense, the podcast that recaps, reviews, and deep dives facts from the Big Bang Theory, which we call IQ points. As a reminder... I've seen the series multiple times, but this is Ryan's first time watching, so we do our best to do no spoilers. And Ryan has also been told he's similar to Sheldon, so we keep a point tally of how close Ryan is to Sheldon. So where are we at with that? We are 80 points me being not like Sheldon, and 83 me being like Sheldon. Sheldon is winning currently. It's or been still neck early. and neck this season. Like it's gone back and forth a little bit. It's uh, it really yeah. has been. Yeah. I feel like the first two seasons it was pretty Sheldon all the way, but uh, this season it's been it's been neck and neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to write us an email at theoreticalnonsensepod at gmail dot com. Leave us a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. And speaking of emails, we did get some emails from our fan, Rick, who's written to us multiple times. The first email that Rick sent us is a clarification, as, as he calls. Um, it was something that we mentioned earlier before about current events, because if you're a new li listener, we actually do get pretty far ahead on, on recording all of these, just because we want to be... Well, pretty much we just want to be ahead in case life happens. And honestly, yeah. life is going to happen very soon where <laughs> we're going to we're going to be very happy that we got ahead. As ahead as we, as we are, we're going to be behind that far. It's going <laughs> to switch up very quickly. In the future, I definitely foresee that happening <laughs> with some things that that are happening in life. But but for now, we are ahead. But uh, Rick wrote, hi, Ron and Ryan. Not the first time you've called me Ron. <laughs> I know it's a typo because he calls me Rob a little later on. <laughs> Sorry, Rick, I just have to give you shit about that. <laughs> he says, um, I must have not been clear enough in my last email. I'm sorry for that. I'll attempt to be more clear. When I said the mentioning of a cultural milestones was poor, I did not mean to mention them at all. That would be very difficult indeed. What I meant to say is to be careful how you talk about them. It's very odd sounding months out of live to hear so-and-so will be out when we air, but it's still in our current future. It sounds better to prosperity if you simply say, as Rob did for episode 308, that the Dune sequel is coming out and I'm looking forward to it. It's simple and pointed out with a single time reference. That, that is to say, using multiple time point perspectives to a single event pr presents too much calculus for a typical listener to gain high marks for ease of listening. You listeners, likewise, probably don't have advanced degrees. From Rick. But yeah, no, noted. Yeah, so, but we, we kind of just do whatever. We kind of just live in the moment. <laughs> we'll kind of. I'm a free spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a rebel. I do what I want. Yeah, I'll say what I want. <laughs> when I want to say it. <laughs> and right now, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> and I'm just going to outright say it today. This is airing at the end of April. <laughs> and it's. It's Easter today, so happy it's Easter, Easter Ryan. <laughs> happy uh, Zombie Jesus Day, right? Uh, 
Oh, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> he came back from the dead, right? Yeah, <laughs> happy zombie Jesus day. Happy zombie Jesus. Yeah. It's also, and... <laughs> uh, if you watch The Office, since uh, today is March 31st, it's the day that uh, Swanson, Ron Swanson, right, uh, had like 93 meetings or something because... Uh, you said, from Parks and Rec, not, you, you yeah. said The Office. Oh, yeah, Parks and Rec, not yeah. Office. Uh, yeah. Same writer, though. Yeah, same, 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 or same showrunner. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah, a lot of the same characters, or actors, right? Not characters, but... Uh, well, R- Rashida Jones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and... I thought there was I'm a little shocked, there. actually, that Amy... Now that I'm thinking about it, it's shocking that Amy Poehler didn't do a guest appearance in The Office. That would have been amazing if they had some sort of crossover. Yeah. That would have been cool. Uh, but anyways... I, I'm just saying that because I've been watching The Office, like, nonstop, where I'm, I'm finishing up season three now, so that's been my go-to show when I've had free time to watch it for my first go-around. Uh, but, yeah, let yeah. that be clear. This is Ryan's very first time watching not only The Big Bang Theory, but also The Office. <laughs> Life must be pretty good for you right now. It's good. And every now and then I bring up a joke from The Office, and people are like, oh, yeah, it was a funny episode. I'm like, it was hilarious. This is my first time watching it. And they're like, what the hell? <laughs> first time. <laughs> I know. What's wrong with you? I don't know where I was for the first part of 2000s. Like, two, 2005 to 2015, I was just, like, out. <laughs> oh, no, we were hanging out. I was still watching The Office. <laughs> <laughs> doing i don't know <laughs> brewing beer something productive that's true caring about your career <laughs> oh yeah that thing <laughs> <laughs> gross well the next email from rick was also a follow-up uh he says rob end of episode i did not tune out but it was close and this is um the episode that just launched right it was um the vengeance formulation we we went on a pretty um we got pretty out there on that one (laughs) it happens (laughs) but he does have a recommendation for a food uh vis-a-vis food podcast aspirations because i'm always trying to turn this into a food cast because i love food and there's going to be lots of food talk in this coming episode so look forward to that as in don't tune out but Rick is recommending Food Wars, Shokugu, Shokugeki no Sama is an anime you might enjoy and or have a rewatch podcast about. It's over the top, super odd way of making food competitions seem like high drama and very amusing, if not laugh out loud funny. You can find it on Crunchyroll, Amazon, and even iTunes. Enjoy, Rick. I actually did, um, I added it to my queue or not my queue, it's it's on my watch list on Amazon. I was going to watch it while I did some cardio, because I, I, that's like the only time I could really watch animated stuff, because my wife isn't super into animated stuff, and my kid only watches stuff on Disney Kids. So, <laughs> yeah, so I have to watch it on my own in the mornings when I do cardio, and I just kind of been skipping my cardio sessions a lot. I've been a little bad this week, so <laughs> I'm hoping this coming week. Bad, Rob. Very bad. <laughs> yeah, I'm not hitting uh, my steps. I don't even have cardio, <laughs> so yeah. you're doing better than I am. <laughs> well, I do what I can. It's because I eat a uh, an ungodly amount, so I need to. Have you? Uh, there, there was an episode of Rick and Morty. It's uh, making it ha- seem like high stakes. Reminded me of this, where uh, part of Rick and part of Rick and Morty mm-hmm. is they watch like TV shows from other galaxies and universes that get really weird at times and one of them is like uh it's like the cake show is it uh cake or not cake uh where people have to guess like oh is this bedroom set cake or is it not cake or what in the bedroom set is cake uh but this is um if the cake is sentient or if it's human or not and so there's a person like you can tell i'm not cake i'm alive i have feelings don't come into me (laughs) That's exactly what a cake would say. That's what cake says all the time. (laughs) All right, well, that's all the emails that we have, but I will be addressing another email a little later on. So I'll wait till we get to that part, and then we will get to it. I was going to say, too, um, it's funny that uh, Rick called you Ron, um, because my girlfriend's been making fun of me that every time I, like, introduce myself, 
I say, this is Ryan, R-Y-A-N. Uh, and she's like, you don't have to spell that. But I've noticed every single time I don't spell it out, people assume I say Brian. And it's like, I the other day I was eating dinner and I was talking to some people at a bar and uh, they're like, oh, what's your name? I'm like, Ryan. And they started calling me Brian. I'm like, the one time I don't spell it out. And so uh, that became awkward very quickly. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, why do you spell it out? Because I have to fix it before it becomes an issue. Yeah. <laughs> I will say that one time I actually was emailing someone so fast. And rather than spell checking, I actually did um, sign it as Ron. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was just like cranking through emails and I was just like, blah, 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 send. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Every now and then I, I, I call myself Ryab. Like somehow I push the B instead of the N. And like you well, said, I'm going so fast, it's Ryan. <laughs> like, yeah. I think that's my name. <laughs> like, wait a, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know, it's Brian. <laughs> it's Brian. Of course it's Brian. <laughs> well, Brian is leading this episode today. And there was, you were saying that we have a, another email, which I didn't read. I left it in the email box for you because I didn't want to ruin the episode. So I still don't know what it says. Uh, okay. So yeah. That's uh, Rebecca's episode. Or- Rebecca's email. So Rebecca, shout out to you. I'm going to read that email that I am sorry. We So, oh, yeah. another thing I thought about. <laughs> sorry, I never actually respond to the emails. I just assume you're going to listen to the episode and <laughs> are going to hear the response. And I know we're getting super far ahead. So I emailed her like two weeks ago and <laughs> flash forwarding that this is going to air in like four weeks. So Rebecca, I'm not ghosting you. It just took you six weeks to realize that I'm responding to you. I just assumed we have like telepathic powers. Like when we read it, they know our response. They just know it. And uh, yeah. apparently that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, <so> terrible. <laughs> but we should dive into the episode just to make sure that people don't tune out. Yes. So let's get her done. Okay. So we are on season three, episode 10, the gorilla experiment. This aired December 7th, 2009, which I was talking to Rob that the next episode is going to be a Christmas episode. And I love those. So I'm so excited. But, you know, that's going to be in a couple of weeks. Um, this was directed by Mark Sandrowski, like always. Writers are Chuck Lorre, Bill Prady. And this is uh, Stephen Molaro. Um, did I misspell that? It looks wrong. Molaro. Malero, yeah, he's okay. uh, he's actually done a lot of um, yeah, I don't know why it looks yeah. Weird. Sometimes I look at a word and like it just doesn't look right anymore. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, so Malero, uh, we start off at the apartment and the gang is eating dinner, and Penny tosses food in the air and catches it with her mouth. That's something I've never been able to do, even at like a uh, what are those called the restaurants where they cut stuff up and cook it in front of you uh so you embarrass the chef by missing the shot every single time in fact i'm like can you just pass me this is gonna be it's gonna be horrible for all involved uh and they never let me pass and it always ends up staining my clothes and i'm just i'm terrible and they're like well don't move and so i'm like holding there like i can't move because if i move (laughs) you throw off their aim and like i flinch or something you know like, like, oh, like, eh, there's food me. coming at me <laughs> <laughs> danger danger there's a projectile coming at my face <laughs> it's a shrimp it's a flying shrimp <laughs> and so sheldon gets upset and looks at leonard and leonard says that he thinks it upsets sheldon when people play with their food and sheldon corrects leonard it upsets him when penny takes the food out of the box Therefore, making the proportions inequitable. Uh, And then he claims that by doing so is what causes famine and compares it to India. And basically looks at Raj for this one. And Raj quickly shakes his head. "Mm." Um, mm -mm. He he gives that gesture like, no, that's not right. (laughs) No. And I did an <laughs> IQ point, not, not a super IQ point on this, but a little bit of research um, about famine in India. And, uh, you know, I haven't never heard a whole lot about it. Uh, but as far as I read, like, the famines aren't quite as drastic now. Like, apparently, uh, in the late 1800s and up to the mid 1900s, they could get really bad in India. And uh, did you do any research into this? 
I didn't. Didn't? Um, so uh, my main article that I looked at, author, so I just put et al., uh, but very fascinating article where they talked about the different reasons for the famines and what caused them kind of went into some, I don't know, there were fancy diagrams and stuff that I didn't really understand. But for the most part, there's been several famines over the centuries, uh, over the last like two centuries, uh, 150 years at least. And it says out of like the six worst ones, five of them were due from soil moisture drought. Um, it says that three of those deadly droughts were linked to a positive phase of El Nino Southern Oscillation. So basically some of them were, and I'm not surprised by this, British rule influenced quite a bit of them too. In fact, the 1943 famine was not just drought, it was basically British, uh, what do they call it? Colonization. Uh, basically, Britain's uh, policies when they invaded India and basically took all their crops and all their stuff and said, this is our stuff now. Uh, but apparently during this 1943 famine, which was called the Bengal famine, an estimated 3 million people died. And it's, you know, from this article, it suggests that some of the issues were caused by fear of World War II and the issues going on with uh, going into war, the war taking over the world and causing fear and stuff, um, some diseases, I think some malaria, but also failure of food distribution that Britain was basically exporting lots of crops from India, yet restricting imports due to wartime um, rations and whatnot. And so, yeah, basically the, you know, as much as Sheldon was like looking at Raj, uh, is Britain had a lot of reasons. It's kind of impact. true. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like, yeah. Um, and then apparently after India gained independence, uh, they made expansions, according to this article, uh, of irrigation, improved their public distribution system, uh, increased uh, rural employment and transportation, and all of these uh, helped to decrease the impact of droughts. So basically by being independent and focusing on themselves without Britain stepping in and saying, no, you just have to give us everything. Um, I'm really oversimplifying politics here. Uh, they were able to improve a lot. So apparently the famines haven't been as bad uh, since the World War II one. Um, and yeah, as far as I could tell, there's been nothing as extreme. So I thought it was kind of out of place for Sheldon to say that. Uh, but throughout history, there have been some very traumatic issues with famines in India. So anyways, Raj shakes his head no. Like, I I don't know what he's talking about, or he doesn't agree with Sheldon. And Penny asks if she should just put her food back. And Leonard, again, Sheldon looks up Leonard, and Leonard says it upsets Sheldon when you play with the Sheldon. Um, I, I kind of like that line because it's like uh, we all know that they're just picking on Sheldon, yet he's getting all worked up. Howard enters the room and Bernadette is with him and he introduces Bernadette and apparently this is the first time uh, Raj has met Bernadette, right? Uh, yeah, and Martin he introduces Sheldon. her as as his girlfriend. As his girlfriend. And he says, Bernadette, uh, I, I didn't even write it down. Say a shizzo to my... Uh, your dizzles? <laughs> yeah, some your dizzles or something is gibberish. And she goes, I can't do that. I don't have the same street cred as you. Uh, and so... I, He's I, flexing in front of his girl. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like that she just kind of accepts him. Uh, and from the beginning, she's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but you <laughs> can, type thing. Yeah. Uh, and Leonard invites her in, says the more the merrier. And Sheldon says that's not true, um, that if you filled the room with people, they would be basically suffocating. And that they have food for five people, not six. And they're like, well, we can just eat it like family style and it's you know five people food for five people it's you know it's not going to be that much different yeah um, and she does not look she's tiny yeah <laughs> does not yeah. look like she's going to eat a lot they have more than enough <laughs> and so sheldon walks away and Bernadette almost sits in his space and this is great because penny is the one to explain exactly why uh no one sits in sheldon's space um and Sheldon comes back and looks at her and says, uh, 
there may be hope for you after all. And I like that because it jumpstarts the whole episode of him and her have like an education, right? They, uh, he tries to teach her some about physics. Uh, but yeah, and some her reaction her. is her smile is so sincere. Like that, that self, like, um, like self satisfaction, like, yes, I did it. <laughs> she has, uh, her facial expressions in this episode are spot on. Like, uh, she carries the episode, I would say, with her facial expressions between being confused, being angry, being upset to spitting out, not spitting out, but showing her chewed food. Uh, she, she just, she did great this episode. She does great. Like, her facial expressions, like, throughout the entire series have been, like, on point. Like, they're mm -hmm. amazing. She's excellent. Yeah. Um, all right, so then we get the opening, and we are back at the apartment, and Bernadette likes Penny's shoes, and so they start this uh, conversation about shoes, where did you get them, and Sheldon mentions his mom was right, that hell is real, and apparently listening to them talk about shoes is his hell, and then Howard mentions, says, oh, let the women folk chit-chat, right, uh, and it causes some offense, and... You know, Penny's the first to say, like, what? Uh, but Bernadette's like, oh, don't take him seriously. Uh, a lot of what he says is intended for humor. I'm pretty sure, um, yeah, I, I actually, uh, what was I say? oh, I get one point for being like Howard here. That my You say opinion, sexually offensive things. Not always, <laughs> but, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I try to be funny, and I often get that response as, Oh, he's just trying to be funny, you know. <laughs> uh, what what does she say too? That uh, does she say it next? That oh, uh, he um, he just lights up every time I laugh. <laughs> every time I laugh, <laughs> like hey, whatever, it's like laugh, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think, she's a uh, keeper. <laughs> don't ever let her go, right? Mm -hmm. So, anyways, um, I try not to be offensive or sexist with comments, but you know, I do try to say things that are funny that people just look at me like, what the hell is wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> it was funny to me. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was funny. Can't I'm just, laughing uh, my ass off <laughs> over here. Humor me and at least smile about it, right? Uh, <laughs> Give me a pity laugh, please. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. I'm not too embarrassed to take a pity laugh. <laughs> not above that. Okay, so that's one point. And then... Bernadette starts talking to Leonard about his upcoming experiment. She explains that had she not gone into microbiology, she would have gone into physics or ice dancing. I'm guessing she means like figure skating, but I wasn't sure. Did you? I kind of just took it as figure skating. Okay. I was like, yeah. is there another type of ice dancing where people like actually dance a ballet on ice without skates? Or, or play a character on Disney on ice. Yeah. Ice capades. And so um, Leonard starts to explain his experiment, and I tried to do a little IQ point on this, but did you do anything? I attempted. I spent a little time on this, but this was so beyond me and so boring. boring. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I got like an hour into researching this, and I realized that I wasn't even paying attention to the things <laughs> I was reading. It's like, this is so boring boring and so hard to understand like you need to learn like different levels and tiers of magnetism to really understand it and i was like i can't i read i read articles i watch videos it's like this if i'm falling asleep even if i this our viewers are going to fall asleep so not happening i noticed too like every word every other word um was a link to another article so like to read one article you would have to read like 50 other articles for it to yeah. begin to make sense uh but um you know the way i did it or broke it down was the notion that uh leonard is testing the i'm gonna aronov bomb quantum interference effect and from what i understand and from reading sciencedirect.com which I, I believe they made this article for like elementary school kids and i still get confused by it like they're, they're really <laughs> trying to dumb it down and so like what <laughs> uh, explain it to me as if i'm five <laughs> <laughs> what is the electricity <laughs> what's a magnet i don't know um can we just have pretty pictures <laughs> or like you know anthropomorphize these things you know I, yeah. I'm an electron that smiles and dances yeah <laughs> Do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm Mr. Magnetfield. <laughs> and I'm Mrs. Electron. <laughs> <laughs> so 
But from what I get from this is that there's a strange, almost uh, scary, uh, spooky, odd instance where electrons uh, that are being shot through space, if they come by what they call a um, cylinder uh cylinders basically when uh electrons are passing by a enclosed mechanism that has magnetic forces on the inside and somehow scientists have a way of making like a you know tube that has magnetic forces inside but none extending outside so like you know with magnets we see them like have a magnetic field around them this is just like an all super enclosed magnet not influence anything outside this unit but apparently when they shoot electrons around this uh the electrons have a phase shift basically even though they're not being influenced by the magnetic field they know it's there somehow and it's changing how they react and i couldn't really understand how the change changes electrons or what and from what i understand it's not necessarily changing their pattern or their path but it's influencing how they react and it seems kind of interesting that again this magnetic field that shouldn't be influencing anything is somehow influencing electrons uh i'm guessing this has something to do with um what do they call that spooky at a distance type thing where particles react one way when nothing's observing them but when people start observing them they behave a different way so it's kind of like oh i remember when we talked about that yeah I, I think it has you know it's a long you know it's a different thing but it's along the same uh lines that somehow parts of the universe are influencing each other in ways that we have no idea like why would they be related or why are they connecting when they should not be um so that's what i gathered from it and he's basically going to be shooting electrons uh and seeing how they are influenced by this magnetism that shouldn't be influencing them at all I feel like I'm going to call that an IQ point. Uh, that's fair. You know, you know what you got to do. You, uh, you, you did enough research. <laughs> I, I feel like it was a good summary of what it was. So I'm going to call that an IQ point. And if it's not a good summary, somebody please explain it with the dancing <laughs> electron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So Sheldon compares Leonard's work. He's really, really putting Leonard down in this episode to kids growing lima beans and paper towels. And Raj whispers something to Sheldon because he can't talk with the girls in the room. And Sheldon says he appreciates it, but he does not like Raj's moist breath in his ear. And I'm like, that's it. That's fair. That, that's fair, yeah. Especially after eating dinner, like there's little food yeah. particles and stuff. Like, I, I can see that. Um, so Sheldon says Howard's shoes are delightful and asks, where did he get them? And everybody kind of looks at him. Bazinga! He doesn't yeah. give a shit. He says <laughs> hey, he doesn't care, but whatever. Uh, and then he looks at Penny, and she sticks his her food out at him. Ah. I I love the brother sister relationship that they're creating for Sheldon and Penny. I yeah. love it. <laughs> it. It works great. Uh, yeah. They uh, and you know, I want to say chemistry, but it's not a romantic chemistry. But the way they play, well, you just have chemistry. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's like you and I have chemistry, Brian. I know we do. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving forward, we're at the apartment again, and Sheldon is playing Mario Kart with Raj, and he loses horribly, apparently. And Raj mentions that, uh, be it a real car or a virtual car, Sheldon just can't drive. And this is what I mentioned before a couple episodes ago when um, he had to drive Penny to the hospital in the adhesive duck yeah. um, episode where I was like, how does it? Because after I watched it, I was like, this doesn't make sense with all the video games that he plays. Wouldn't he be at least de be decent at driving? But then this kind of explains it. Like even in a video game like Mario Kart, he still sucks at driving. Despite how uh, how many video games he plays, he still sucks at it. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'd have to say, uh, 
Mario Kart is a long stretch from actually driving. It is. Uh... That's no. That's pretty much how I learned how to drive. You know, <laughs> I drop banana. I drop banana peels outside the window. I throw purple shells <laughs> with spikes on it. I actually make these ceramic shells at home, and I yeah. have them in my car just to pick up and throw out the window yeah. every now and then. <laughs> Apparently, that's illegal and it's a distraction. But I feel like I I've have gotten. To do it. <laughs> I've gotten several tickets, but. Several. but worth it you know maybe i shouldn't have thrown the shell at the cop but whatever <laughs> it's how i avoid the jail i have to i have to disorient him oh, I, I don't know if i mentioned this but i was, was a couple months ago maybe it was well, last year i think um i was playing mario kart with uh one of our mutual friends and he was over with his wife and he's usually really really a lot better at it than I am, but I was kicking his butt. And he goes, I don't know why I'm so bad at this tonight. And his wife goes, maybe it's all those margaritas you've been drinking. He's like, no, oh yeah. <laughs> so, apparently drinking oh. and driving video games it impacts you too. <laughs> yeah. Nah, nah, nah. I'm better when I drink. <laughs> I'm more concentrated, I swear, Ossifer. <laughs> Now take the shell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, so Penny comes in and asks if she can talk in private. <laughs> Part confused me so much, but I laughed. Uh, Sheldon looks at Raj and says, go away. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, I thought it's rude too, but you know, she's asking. And then like, he gets up and like walks into like somebody's bedroom. Like, where does yeah, he go? Like, I guess I'll go hang out in this room. <laughs> And it never explains where he goes. Maybe just the bathroom. <laughs> like, can I come out yet? Uh, I don't know. And yeah, if you were if you had to hang out in someone's room, either Sheldon or Leonard's, who would you go to? I do love this character trait of Penny. Like, she's not like the average girly girl. She doesn't get squirmish. She she kills the bugs for the guys and everything like that. She's yeah. definitely tougher than all the guys and everything. And I love <laughs> that character trait, which they kind of explained earlier that her father raised her as a boy for like a yeah. long time. But I love that she isn't the typical damsel in distress. Mm -hmm. That And that's something that I love about her character. It reverses those... Uh character roles and the guys are more of the damsels than she is yeah yeah um <laughs> i took the one with the frog <laughs> um so she suggests um or sh she suggests sheldon should take it like an experiment um so that you know he can get something out of it too because he's really not and he's like well i could handle this like experiment and he brings up Coco the gorilla and how teaching the gorilla sign language was like an experiment as well. Um, and I actually did some research. This is my third IQ point on Coco the gorilla. Yeah, I did too. I did. You want to take this one? Sure. So Coco the gorilla. I found this information on time.com and Coco.org. So Coco the gorilla actually recently died back in 2018. She I was, was 46 years old. I know. Um, I, for born... some reason, I thought she passed like in the 80s or something. But I know. It's like nobody ever talks about her, I <laughs> <Yeah>. guess. <laughs> but she was 46 years old. She was born on July 4th, 1971. She knew up to 1,000 signs and was able to communicate quite well with humans. She's known to adore cats. She asked for a cat for Christmas in 1983, where researchers initially gave her a stuffed cat, which she refused to play with, and she kept signing sad. So then they gave her a cat. So it's like, I, I thought that that was like really sweet. And that cat sadly died uh, six months later, where it was hit by a car. And then um, her keeper, Penny Patterson, first started teaching Coco sign, it took Coco about two weeks to start using correct signs for gestures, for food and drink and more. And then her most rapid gains were between uh, ages two and a half to four and a half years. Sheldon says that Coco learned to sign over 2,000 words, none of which are, have anything to do with shoes, but all the articles that I found said that she only signed 1,000 words. You know, I read a little bit about that, and I, I got the, she learned to sign a thousand words, but she understood over 2,000 or around 2,000. 
So she oh, okay. signed so, them, but if somebody she brought knew up it. this word, yeah, she understood it. Oh, okay, that's what it was. All right, yeah. that makes more sense the, then. After doing some digging, that's what the conclusion I came to because I was like, "He said two thousand. What the fuck? <laughs> you lied yeah. to me, Sheldon. I know, <laughs> liar." <laughs> Well, that's all I had. I'm sure you got some more information on that. You know, if Sheldon asked me to leave, I'd probably go into Sheldon's just to piss him off. <laughs> yeah, fair. And you're also, without Leonard there, technically you're Sheldon's guest. So you oh, should be yeah. going into his room. I also, And also, I would imagine that he has more comics than Leonard. So you could entertain yourself a little bit more. I, I figured out Leonard's stuff, like I wouldn't feel as stressed out touching it. Like, yeah. Leonard's like, would probably be like, whatever, if you want to play with that robot. But she'll be like, don't yeah. touch my stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which would probably get, you know, if I was trying to piss him off, that would be okay. But yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, he'd tell him to go to the corner and don't even breathe. Don't even <laughs> breathe the air. <laughs> you will infect my comics. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't breathe. Don't look at them. You're going to change them just by observing them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, Penny asks if Sheldon can teach her a little physics. And Sheldon's like, you know, basically, there is no such thing as little physics. It's everything. But she wants to know enough to just talk to Leonard about his job. And I think that's pretty sweet of her to try to yeah. get him and talk about. And she wants to surprise him about it, too, uh, which she does later in the episode. They um, kind of did like hint to this earlier in the episode when like Bernadette was asking about like his experiment. Leonard made that comment about like most people aren't really interested in what I do. It actually the camera actually did shift to Penny and she kind of made a face like, "Oh, wait, what?" <laughs> yeah, you know, it's kind of like, "Oh, that's probably something I should be talking about, but yeah, I haven't." So, uh, yeah. I, I think she's being really nice about that. Yeah. I figure, uh, some people would probably be like, "Whatever, I don't care," but you yeah. know, uh, <laughs> Ain't my job. Uh, don't give a shit. <laughs> it's like Monica and Chandler. It didn't get to like the last, like second to last se season when, when she finally learned what he did for a living. Like, did they even actually ever say, or did they just like name what his job was or something? Like, it was like, even when it ended, I still don't know exactly what he did. I know he well, moved to Texas I, for part of it. I know they explained what he does, but they didn't say what his job title is. He just said, I do this, and I analyze this. But they never actually gave him a title. I, I remember, isn't that how they win the apartment in one of the first episodes? They're doing yeah. the trivia. Yep. Yep. <laughs> one of the greatest episodes of all time. <laughs> what do they say? Something like, he's a transponster or something like that. <laughs> you really don't That's, not know what I do. <laughs> That's not even a word. That's not even a word. That's Miss Chenandler Bong. <laughs> You should know you've been selling that magazine for years. <laughs> I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this is not a Friends podcast. So. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> All right. So, um, she is going to learn, and he says that it's going to be a massive undertaking, and his time is uh, valuable and very limited, and she points out that he's wasting it playing video games. He says point yeah <laughs> so he gives her uh the win there and uh she cl or he asks her what what's her foundation how much does she already know and she goes she took the class with the frogs and i, I just love the look on sheldon's face as good as her <laughs> facial expressions this is she broke him right like, <laughs> one with the frogs and she goes it made a lot of girls throw up but i gutted that thing like a deer <laughs> i got a little bit more i went down like kind of a weird rabbit hole on some of this uh I don't know why. Maybe it's because I always, I feel weird about teaching gorillas sign language. And apparently, like, I thought it was, like, American sign language. But apparently, from what I was saying, they actually have something called gorilla sign language. So gorillas have their own form of sign language, uh, which would make sense. They don't have the same movements or gestures as, you know, mechanical coordination as we do. Um, but I did find out that her full name is Hanabiko. And... I felt stupid for this because I was like, well, Hana means a uh, flower in Japanese. Uh, what does Biko mean? And apparently the name's supposed to mean fire, um, fireworks child. And because she was born on the 4th of July and it's been shortened just Coco. Uh, but <clears throat> what I forgot was that fireworks translated in Japanese is Hanabi. 
and it's yeah the way i always remembered it was because hana is flower and fireworks look like flowers exploding in the sky so uh it's hanabi for fireworks and ko for child and then her name is just shortened to coco uh for child child or whatever um but yeah she's born on fourth of july um you told when she died what was it Oh, uh, there's some debate if she actually understood the information completely. And they said that she had, like, the IQ of, like, a three-year-old, uh, was able to have the same sorts of conversations as three-year-olds. But some people said because she disregarded grammar entirely that there's some debate on if she understood the utterances she was making. And, you know, to what extent did she or was she just saying random things and were her handlers or owners, uh, making meaning out of them and this is something with um dogs with like have you seen dogs with those buttons yeah i've seen and that it's like yeah. uh food food bitch food bitch you know <laughs> like that uh, and um the question is do dogs know what they're saying or do they just know that they push the button and they get food and then we imply that they have a whole emotional thought process behind it uh where they're actually communicating with us and it's kind of um you know what's the word mute mute point uh because we'll never know and at the end of the day they're getting what they want anyway so they are responding uh i did read about well, their... in, well in this case i feel like coco actually did have an understanding because the, the cat story was like she kept saying that she wanted a cat for christmas they gave her a stuffed cat and then like she just started signing sad i'm sad sad because it wasn't a real cat and then when she got a real cat she's she like perked up so i feel like there is like some emotional intelligence at least to but gorillas some of that might be biasy on the people recording it because they're expecting her to be sad and so they're trying to take away like uh when her first cat died they said she made human like weeping sounds i go what does that exactly mean and uh you know, I'd question it because they're a little bit biased. And, you know, like you say, uh, there's something to be taken from it, but it's still kind of questionable to what extent did she know what she was saying. So it's almost like you're saying that, like, they're potentially filling in the blanks. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that could possibly be it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I don't know a whole lot, but apparently that seems like some of the debate. Um, but okay. she had more cats through her life. Uh, she got two more after the first one got hit by the car. And she called them Lips and Smokey. And I read somewhere that when asked why she called it Lips, uh, she sighed Lips like lipstick. And no further explanation of why that would be the case. Uh, so, you know, it's stuff like that. Like, I'm like, uh, are we trying to imply information? Um, and then in 2015, she got two more cats, Miss Black and Miss Gray. She also had a huge fixation with nipples. And apparently lost well, who does came out of right. That's what I'm <laughs> She's just saying what we're all thinking. <laughs> um, but there were some lawsuits because apparently some of the workers felt uh what's the word? Uh pressure. Objectified. Objectified. <laughs> um actually they weren't mad at the gorilla. They were mad at like the uh like superiors saying oh you have to show her your nipples they felt pressured from management like oh she wants to see your nipples just show them and so people were like this is weird i don't feel like this is okay uh and that's so, not part of my job description <laughs> yeah, that's, not, that's gonna be an extra twenty dollars <laughs> <laughs> wait so they so, yeah. wait so the managers were demanding that the employees flash coco yeah yeah and like uh one had a quote that one of the managers like uh in fact i think it was the actual owner uh said something like once the woman flashed said look she has big nipples coco and so like actually commenting on the co uh nipples which is for a work environment is not not okay uh so yeah uh, understandably there were some lawsuits about that um another expression of grief was apparently they told her when robin williams died and she apparently had a relation a friendship not a relationship friendship with robin williams and really liked his humor uh so when he died they reported that she became very somber and her lips began to quiver like she was going to cry but uh, again i'm like how much of that is them inferring oh that's a sad quivering lip to her just moving um i don't know and, she was uh, just hungry 
She was just hungry. You know? <laughs> uh, give me food. I don't Why care. Food. <laughs> <laughs> Why aren't you feeding me? You have to talk about death. I don't want to. Um, <laughs> when asked about where dead gorillas go, she signed comfortable whole by. And so that, again, uh, that is so abstract that it becomes like we can fill in the blanks and say that oh, they go to a comfortable place, they slip away, and they say goodbye. I, I don't know. It's like, make of it what you will. Every person's going to fit those words together in a different uh, narrative. Um, and then also, like you said, she died in her sleep. It seemed peaceful. Um, but that's what I have on Coco. I thought some of that was interesting about the debates over whether or not she actually understood and to what extent she understood. Well, that kind of runs into parallel with Penny. <laughs> In the yeah, <laughs> she may or may not understand what she's saying. She can repeat uh, things, <laughs> but she doesn't understand it. <laughs> and honestly, I could not find a list of words she knew. So in those thousand words or two thousand that she understood, shoes might have been in there. She knew nipples. <laughs> <laughs> she One of the more important words. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Well, gorillas don't wear shoes. Why would they care <laughs> That's about <just> that? Silly. <laughs> but gorillas need to know about nipples. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, next scene we are at the cafeteria and howard is walking around introducing his girlfriend to strangers at this point she's like who are these people I'm like i don't know um they sit down and he says that she he's showing her the salt mines i love her reaction he, he doesn't mean salt mines he means his work <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Good for him. <laughs> but yeah, I doubled down on that point. Not actually doubling, but I uh, making stupid jokes uh, and, just and having to explain up. it. Oh. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, having to explain. Although I uh, think uh, Leonard got it. It's just he didn't yeah. think it was funny, right? <laughs> it's like okay, uh, <laughs> salt mines. Uh, Bernadette asks about the experiment and wants to see it. Leonard invites her over. Uh, and Howard compares it to Hanukkah in July. And I think she goes, do they actually have that? And, oh, <laughs> you got me again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then they're like eating frozen yogurt. And I thought this was weird. Like it's, it gives her a reason to get up, but she goes, this isn't fat free. This is fatty fat fat. And like gets up and leaves, uh, but I was kind of like, uh, is that like a red flag? Like, she went kind of weird about that fat for your yogurt. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't say that's really a red flag. <laughs> At least not to me. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I But then again, like, these... Fatty, fat, fat, fat. <laughs> Stupid fat. <laughs> this was supposed to be non fat. <laughs> Look what you made. Uh, he just flips the switch. Like, yeah. instant anger. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? He goes, I made up using scientific equipment to seduce women. And Leonard's like, does that work? He goes, no, not yet. So it's not even a real thing. Um, I just goes, like how he, he needs to explain it. Like, you already got the prom queen. Now you're <laughs> after the head of the decorating committee? <laughs> and Leonard's like, I'm not interested. And he goes, uh, don't mess with me. I'm crazy. <laughs> I, I like that scene. I'm like, oh, crazy. Um, Leonard says, well, I believe you on that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that scene ends. They're back at the apartment and Sheldon is starting Project Gorilla, his experiment to teach Penny physics. And Penny comes in and she has not brought a notebook. And he asks her, what are you going to take notes on? Uh, how will you study for the test? She's like, there's going to be tests? And he goes, tests. Um, a whole curriculum. Yeah. Good. You know what? Good for him for taking it serious. Yeah. That Pe Penny wanted to learn, and he wanted to do the best job that he could. <laughs> very, very thorough. Uh, <laughs> A little I, too thorough. Too thorough. <laughs> and so he starts with explaining physics comes from the word physica, the science of natural things. And Before we get into that, I actually do have an IQ point. Ooh. When Sheldon starts, he says that they're going to go on a journey from the ancient Greeks through Isaac Newton to Niels Bohr to Erwin Schrodinger to the Dutch researchers that Leonard is currently ripping off. It is a point of everybody that Leonard does not do original work, that he's always like doing some sort of replicant test. So I 
am playing off an old email from Rick again about oh, replicant no. tests, about how like this kind of plays into that and on um, how there actually is need to have these replicant tests. And the point that people are mocking Leonard for doing it doesn't make sense. If they're true scientists, they should understand that every research needs to be replicated multiple times or it needs to be able to be replicated. Uh, they make fun of Howard too and say that he doesn't really do anything when he's inventing all the stuff they are doing their tests with, right? Yeah, he's so, creating their ideas into physical matter. Yeah, uh, and I, I want to spell out for the viewers, when we say replicant test, we're not talking about Blade Runner, are we? Shit, I better redo this. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Just oh, <no>. kidding. <laughs> and we're done. And podcast over. <laughs> Right. No, we're <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> or am I? <laughs> you come across a tortoise. You turn the tortoise over. What do you do, Rob? What do you do? You step on it. You step on. <laughs> Duh. That's what a replicant would say. <laughs> well, I found all this information on Berkeley.edu and AG e.com which is a publishing site so what leonard is doing is called a replication study which must be 100 percent valid if the university is going to give him funds to conduct this research slash experiment as regular emailer rick has pointed out in an old email this happens quite often and researchers want this to happen the whole point of science is for findings to be replicable because science aims to reconstruct the unchanging rules by which the universe operates. And those same rules apply, need to apply 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from Sweden to Saturn, regardless of who is studying them. If a finding can't be replicated, it's, it suggests that our current understanding of the study. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, you, uh, everything okay? You're getting yeah, in the they, is is there a replicant there? It, there is, oh no. <laughs> it's gonna step on me. If a finding can't be replicated, it suggests that our current understanding of the study system on our methods of testing are insufficient. The desire for replicability is part of the reason that scientific papers almost always include a methods section, which describes exactly how the researchers perform the study. That information allows other scientists to replicate the study and evaluate its quality, helping ensure that occasional cases of fraud or sloppy scientific work are weeded out and corrected. Which is very similar to like what I do as a chef, as I write directions, I, it needs to be easy enough to be replicable. Like how I found a way to make this about me. And there are types and there are different types of replication. So there's direct, direct replication. This follows the same protocols as the original study, with the exception of samples and conditions, meaning the time of the day or the year, lab space, research team, etc. There's conceptual replication, which means performing a study that employs different methodologies to test the same hypothesis as an existing study. Then there's internal replication, which, which is when the same research team conducts the same study while taking negative and positive factors into account. Then there's micro replication, which is conducting partial replications of the findings of other re re research groups. Constructive replication, which both manipulations and measures are varied. And then there's participant replication, which changes only the participants. And looking back at season two, Leonard was actually replicating the dark matter signal found in sodium iodide crystals by the Italians. And then he was also working with detecting dark matter with Dr. David Underhill, where they examined the radiation levels of photomultiplier tubes for a new dark matter detector. Now it seems that he has transitioned to a new project, the 
a heronov bohm quantum interference effect. So it seems like Leonard is constantly changing jobs and changing projects. So he must be doing a really good job if he's constantly moving to a different project. Or he's doing a really bad job in his <laughs> bailing ship. <laughs> Drop this and go to the next project. Oh, fuck it. Done. Fuck it. Oh, is, no, that's all fucked up. Okay, next yeah. project. What are they? Well, that's what I found. So Nice catch. So his work, it'll come in later. All, mm. uh, in a in a episode or two, where like he gets mocked again for doing replicant studies, but that's a very valid thing. Like you don't yeah. always have to like do original research, but I guess that's kind of like where some of these people think like that's where like the real glory is. Mm. Like you need to like put your name in the books. You need to be famous. And you need to do an original or study. Something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he's doing great work it seems like yeah i think they just give each other a hard time and it's not really uh fair <laughs> but no yeah so yeah um I, I could catch on that because i did pick up that they're kind of hassling him on repeating the same experiments but you're right that uh it needs to be done that that's how we challenge stuff and make sure it's valid and just because a study get, gets an answer from one study, it could have been a fluke. Mm -hmm. Like it, it could have been bad research or something, or like not all things were put into account. So it needs to like you be you need to be able to prove that you can get from point A to point B every time. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, that experiment that supposedly linked uh, vaccines to autism and then it yeah. turned out everybody who tried to repeat it like could not get the same results which discredited the experiment completely uh it's like yeah i'm glad people uh repeated the experiment because that's something we need to know yeah that's uh, kind of a fluke or a uh it was bad information influenced the study for money <laughs> okay so uh he is talking about physica uh the science of natural things and the story begins in ancient greece uh, and that if she has a question, she needs to raise her hand. And so he says that she is out shopping at the market or Agora. And I looked this up because the only reason I knew this word was agoraphobia, which wasn't exactly what I thought it was. I thought it was a scare being afraid of going outside and being with people. But uh, apparently that's kind of it. Apparently Agora means central public space uh or gathering or gathering space assembly place and it's connected to agoraphobia because it's a fear of places and situations that might cause panic so it's not just the fear of going outside it's the fear of having being outside causing the panic attack and kind of it influence or that's the way i understood it that it was more than just a uh, fear of the outside that's the fear of having the stress put on you uh, by a place so anyways uh he looks at penny and says it's time to take some notes right so she starts taking notes for those tests and he says then her in his story that she notices there are things in the sky and she calls them planetes or wanderers and says this is the start of the 2600 year journey through time and space and this is where you uh, mentioned that i uh, he does the steps between researchers and claims that Leonard is just ripping off dutch researchers and then penny raises her hand asks to go to the bathroom and she's he says can't you hold it and she goes not for 2600 years so she he allows her to go uh like a student in a classroom and he sits down and starts taking more notes on this experiment, saying that he is exhausted. He's and, already burnt out. <laughs> he's already burnt out. This is too much. Uh, we are now in Howard's bedroom, and he is making out with Bernadette. And he is fumbling behind her when she finally stops and says, it unhooks from the front. And he's like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and his mom gets home, and they have a shouting match through the walls like they always do. 
And I like this. She goes, apparently you can forget to ride a bike. And she was doing a senior fitness class and a guy like fell off one and got hurt. So uh, they had to cancel the whole class. Uh, and it, for, it is kind of strange that a senior fitness class would actually have real bikes. Right? That it wouldn't I, be a stationary bike. I would imagine they were stationary. Like, uh, although I he guess still he managed to fall. Off. <laughs> it's <laughs> possible. It's like, uh, <laughs> so, don't know what happened there, but something. Um, Bernadette says she should go because his mom's home, and he says, "No, no." Uh, and then he shouts, I want lamb stew. Uh, but apparently that's going to make her go to the market, which is his plan to get more privacy with Bernadette. And his mom says, I can't resist. Say no to that little tushy face. Uh, <laughs> it, she yells, do you want peas or Lasore? Um, I don't really know what, what's Lasore? I actually researched this because I oh, actually did okay. not know that either. Good. I, I kind of so thought this about is... it, but then I didn't. <laughs> so I'm glad you did. <laughs> So this kind of goes hand in hand. So I'm going to do this IQ point and then we will address Rebecca's email. Brisket. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so regular peas versus Lasor. Le and as, even as a chef, I never use Lasur peas at all. I've never used them at all. Have you but, heard of them um, before? Not until the show. Oh, like, I've man. never, honestly okay i don't have peas a lot in my diet so i don't <laughs> i don't actually look for them i do like um english peas though because you know english peas else, are nice and crunchy who else doesn't have peas in their diets replicants yeah you know, replicants <laughs> you goddamn replicants. oh so yeah caught me brian yeah caught me <laughs> <laughs> Lesur gets its name because of where they're canned in Lesur, Minnesota, which is in America for anybody across across the way, and it's also known as the Valley of the Jolly Green Giant. It's basically the home of the Jolly Green Giant, and compared to regular garden peas, these are smaller, sweeter, they lack the vibrant green hue, and they're a little bit more delicate. So that's really it. It's just a different variety of peas. No idea that's where the Jelly Green Giant lived. Yep. Lesur, <laughs> Minnesota. IQ point. <laughs> there it is. So that's what a Lesur pea is. Nice. And now we will transition over to that email that we got like a little while ago. So in, pre in preparation for this episode, I actually did reach out to Rebecca asking her if lamb stew was a traditional jewish thing i, I just honestly wasn't sure um for him to kind of like scream out to his mom i was wondering like oh is this like a brisket thing where it's like they always kind of have lamb stew is it kind of are there traditional jewish recipes for lamb stew so All that's right. what i wanted to know like i do lamb have cloven feet what type of feet do lamb have are they not kosher? Well, they, they must kosher? be kosher if they're eat if Howard can eat it. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Huh. I guess we better let everybody know now. Is yeah. lamb kosher? Yep, is a kosher animal. Yep. I want to see some lamb feet now. <laughs> that's gonna be weird. <laughs> of all the things on your Google search, that's the weirdest thing. <laughs> some people are into feet. What can I say? I like <laughs> Did you find it? <laughs> Yeah, they have uh, hoofs with two digits. Uh, they are cloven-footed. For some reason, I thought cloven-footed was bad. I'm showing I know like very, very little of this episode. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not on my A game. I'm sorry, yeah. everybody. <laughs> Great job, Brian. Well, I asked Rebecca that question, if lamb stew is a Jewish staple, pretty much. And she wrote, hi. Thanks for reaching out. I still listen to the podcast every two weeks. I get so excited for new episodes. Yay. As to your question, I looked at my recipe book that has been passed down to me and there is no lamb stew recipe, but I do have a leg of lamb and a spiced lamb and veggie kebabs recipe. I do, however, have a Jewish cookbook that has lamb recipes, but no stew. I found a small amount of information in the cookbook that might be helpful. The name of the cookbook is The Complete Jewish Guide to Traditional Jewish Cooking 
by Marlena Spieler. The cookbook says that lamb, as well as mutton, is favored by the Sephardim from North Africa and other Arabic lands in the 20th century. Around this time, this time there was a strong influence from the French that introduced beef and veal to the table. The book also states that due to the time-consuming efforts to remove the sciatic nerve required by the laws of kashrut, keeping kosher, the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jewish European people avoided eating the hindquarters of the lamb until the 15th century, where there was a meat shortage and the process and the process of removing the nerve was necessary. As for lamb being served as a regular meal in Jewish households, I can only speak for my family. Lamb was not something that we ate. My first experience with lamb was in a gyro. Do you say gyro or gyro or gyro? What do you say? I, I say gyro. I always said gyro, but then ever since I moved to Pennsylvania, everybody says gyro. Although um, when I hear gyro, and I like saying gyro because it reminds me of Warcraft 2, like back in the 90s, and you could get invent a gyrocopter, and like the guy who runs is like, I'm the gyrocopter! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, gyrocopter. <laughs> Sounds like something a replicant would say. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, back to the email. My first experience with lamb was in a euro from a local fast food joint. For other Jewish families and possibly more religious families, as long as the lamb is, slatter- is slaughtered properly, then it can be served as a meal. This all has to do with being kosher. I have been to Shabbat de dinners that served lamb as an option, but to my knowledge, there is no special or religious connection to lamb. Howard's mom does make a lot of great Jewish foods and have meaning or can be linked to holidays. I think in this case, Howard just really likes his mom's lambs too. Let me know if you have any more questions. Rebecca. So thanks, Rebecca, for that really detailed email and explanation. And Thank you if you actually had to like dust off the book and like find that 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 answer. We really appreciate it. I, I love and, lamb, so uh I I, oh, I do recipes. too. I, I don't think Americans eat enough lamb. That's some I know some people are like it's an ethical thing. I'm like oh, it tastes so good. Oh I know. They are baby sheep. And so. mm. who is though? <laughs> We're all baby sh- We're all <laughs> metaphorically sheep. <laughs> <Bah>. <laughs> I love lamb, and my wife hates lamb, so that means I never eat lamb. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. That's... Have you ever heard, uh, do you know who Dennis Leary is? Yeah. Yeah, um, he had some, I don't know what it was on, I saw it online, where he's talking about shepherd's pie. And, like, traditionally, shepherd's pie is made with lamb, not beef. But mm-hmm. in America, we just don't have as much lamb uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, and so it's usually made with ground beef instead of ground lamb. And he's talking about it. And he goes, so, you know, in Ireland, you get these pies and shepherd's pies. And, you know, families were poor, poor and we had a lot of mouths to feed. So we would... Uh, grind up whatever he could and put it into the pie and you know everybody's like this is great pie it's great pie but at the end of the day when you think about what you're eating it's ball pie it's the balls they put all the balls (laughs) into the pie (laughs) (laughs) you know what i'm good with that (laughs) i'm okay with that whatever I'm okay. Grind it up, saute it up, add some onions, carrots, mashed gravy, potatoes, mashed gravy. potatoes. It's, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> and I and Rebecca, I actually just literally tonight made your great grandmother's brisket again, and it was as always fantastic. And self shout out to ourselves. If you want to see how that recipe is made, you should check out our YouTube page. It was really good. <laughs> yeah. Have you made it again since? I have not. I have not. Ugh, uh, missing out, man. <laughs> I should. But that's uh, Lesser Peas and Lamb Stew. Nice. Very educational. 
<laughs> I kind of wish that Big Bang Theory had a cookbook. Is there? Ooh. You know, I, I saw one the other day on uh, Diablo. It was like a cookbook for Diablo. Uh, the like, un- the like, what uh, like an unofficial guide? Yeah, uh, for like recipes that you see in it. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously L- Lilith has like a pizza recipe. Lilith's <laughs> <laughs> pizzeria. Yeah, <laughs> the wood fire L- Lilith's wood fire pizza. <laughs> Raked over the coals of tortured Jeez. souls. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because that makes sense. <laughs> oh, there is a Big Bang Theory cookbook. I don't know if it's the official one by Joey Triggs. The not so gastronomically redundant cookbook. I might have to check this out. I wonder if they have lamb stew in there. That's right. Oh, it's Kindle for two days. Oh, it's a big recreation of Cheesecake Factory menu because it's based on Penny. Oh, that's not oh, right. Man, I don't know if I like that. I was hoping for more of like Howard's mom's recipes. I still have to look into it though, but there's a lot of books on uh Okay, I'm gonna go down. Oh my goodness. Uh well, here's British another one. Pub cookbook. Big Bang <laughs> Cookbook Theory. Recipes that will make you part of Sheldon's friend group. Overview. No overview. Well, I feel like, man, that would actually be fun to do. Is like go through each episode, whatever food that they're eating, just recreate it. Kind of like binging with Bobish. If you ever watch that, do you ever watch him on on YouTube? I don't think so. Oh, fucking fantastic! <laughs> um, basically, this guy just recreates all the foods that you see on TV. So anytime you see something in like like popular movies and tv shows um yeah. like like spongebob krabby patties he made mm-hmm. krabby patties um twister do you remember twister when they make the steaks where the after the twister comes by and kills all the cows they yeah. just make steaks so he recreated that <laughs> meal so things like that his channel is amazing binging with bobbish it's great he might have done some fraser things i don't know but oh, like in Parks and Rec, he did um, all the stuff that Ron Swanson eats uh-huh. um, in the office. Whenever Michael kind of eats something kind of crazy or something like that, he did it. Like the oh, you're not there yet. The pretzel? Did you see Pretzel Day? I don't think I saw a pretzel one. That might be season four. Hmm. I, I just no. got by. Uh, he Pretz- ran over or hit the girl, uh, the woman with his car, and they actually had a no relay that, you. Oh yes, you I must. You did see Pretzel because at that point Jan was still boss. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, and the one guy goes down. And he's like, "I work all year, and this is the one day <laughs> I care about." Yeah. But yeah, he recreated that pretzel. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So like that. Oh man, I binged his show so often. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> yeah, we should probably get back to. <laughs> yeah. I'm hungry now. <laughs> All right, so uh, he, he, the mom leaves. Uh, Howard's mom leaves, and Bernadette's phone buzzes, and she says she'll put it on vibrate. And he goes, "I'm already on vibrate," <laughs> and she gets that joke, so <laughs> she laughs. I'm like, "Nice." Um, apparently, the phone is Leonard, and Leonard is saying that Howard is being weird about the experiment, and that he's going to be weird if she comes to see it, and I. Uh, Howard claims that he doesn't need her to ask her permission to go to the experiment. He needs Leonard to ask his permission. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the next scene is her leaving the house and he yells, I don't want to eat lamb stew with my mom. <laughs> and he goes, I'm so close to getting that raw, too. <laughs> <laughs> Which we learned from, from last episode is... Uh, well, no, wait, it's a future episode. I got them mixed up. <laughs> I've been watching ahead. I've been watching oh, back. No. I've been watching for and everything. Is later on where you'll figure out the bases that they get to. <laughs> Time flows in all directions for Ron yeah. when he watches. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, just like the um, the magnet that we just talked about last <laughs> last episode. <laughs> all right, so we're back at the apartment, and Sheldon is still lecturing, and Penny is just confused as hell, and the board is like. It probably makes sense, uh, but it looks all over the place. Like, there's no order. Like, things are just 
scattered around, uh, and I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And he asks, um, M, if uh, M A equals M G, uh, yeah, uh, what can she learn about this? And she's just, yeah, I can't even begin to understand what he was trying to say. Uh, he was doing mathematical formulas. But she I think the thing that he was trying to say, I remember this was from physics, that was um, F equal, I already forgot what the board said, but I know that he, he was getting at that things fall, everything falls at the same rate in the vacuum. Yeah. That's kind of um, what he was, like, that's what it was. <laughs> and she's, well, he says something like MA equals MG, and what do we know about MG? And uh, she goes like, what, it's squared, it's Newton, <laughs> it's five! <laughs> <laughs> and this brings up um, Fig Newtons because she asks if uh, the name of the cookie comes from Isaac Newton. And Sheldon says, no, that comes from a small town in Massachusetts. And I, I looked into this. Uh, did you look into Fig Newtons at all? I did. <laughs> uh, I want to hear what you got because uh, there, okay. there's something <laughs> I, I want to add to it. I'm curious if you picked up on it. Okay. Well, the history of the Fig Newton. The Fig Newton was originally created from a cookie maker, Charles M. Roser of Ohio in 1891. He worked for a bakery in Philadelphia who sold his recipe to Kennedy Biscuit Company. Kennedy Biscuit, the Boston-based company, had a habit of naming their cookies after local towns, and they already had cookies named um, Beacon Hill, Harvard, and Shrewsbury when the newton was created roser probably based his recipe on fig rolls up until then a locally homemade cookie brought to the u.s by british immigrants as of 2012 the fig dropped out of the name and now they're just called newtons and after several years and several mergers that company turned into nabisco and apparently National Fig Newton Day is January 16th. Huh. Yeah, there, there's a day for everything. So, and, uh, um, okay. well, yeah, um, I'll get into to this after, but I looked into the top-selling cookies uh, in America. So, so I'll let you go first. <laughs> a couple things that I found out uh, on top of the, like, I thought it was interesting, like, it took me a while to find that the reason they named it... Um, Fig Newton uh, is named after the small town. Like, why would they name it after a small town? Because they were naming it after all their products were named after local towns, right? Uh, yeah. So, um, but also part of the reason uh, British immigrants brought it over is because apparently physicians, like, whenever people got sick, like, one of their go-tos was, oh, it's your digestive tract. Uh, eat a biscuit and some fruit. And so they became popular because they're kind of like a digestive or thought to be digestive aids. But also, I didn't realize Nabisco stood for National Biscuit Company. It's short for National Biscuit Company. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that blew my mind. I'm like, oh, they, they, they're a biscuit company. They merged with New York Biscuit Company and get Nabisco Company. Nabisco. Biscuit Company, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was big uh, for me. But here's here's the real kicker, and it's going to just blow your case with the cookie list away. In the late eight, 1980s and early 1990s, Fig Newtons had a campaign. Do you remember what the slogan was? No. It's not a cookie. It's fruit and cake. So they're talking about cookies. Fig Newtons aren't cookies by their own admission. Well, this puts a lot into the question <laughs> of my list, then. <laughs> you, you should look at some of uh, those commercials. It's like Kids are like, oh, I love this cookie. Oh, it's not a cookie. It's fruit and cake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do they still exist? I'll have to look that up. <laughs> I, I, but, lo yeah. I watched them on YouTube. So I was like, oh my I didn't God. dream these, did I? Like, they're, they're not cookies. <laughs> but they are cookies. <laughs> <laughs> For all intents and purposes, yeah, they, it's a cookie. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like um, they're saying that, like something isn't a candy, but like um, it's like saying um, Kit Kat isn't candy; it's a cookie because it's a wafer. Oh yeah, like there are that uh, there. There's that argument too, but you know what? It's in the candy section. We all call it candy. I'll call it candy. <laughs> well, the top selling cookies in America. 
is not a correct list, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's flawed. I have no reason to live. <laughs> what is a What is life? <laughs> uh, I'll just admit it. I am a replicant. <laughs> My brain just broke. <laughs> Well, honestly, be, before you even told me that, I questioned this because there is kind of like two cookies on there that are basically the exact same thing. So it's like, why are you putting them in the same like thing? Yeah. Unless they actually are being sold by itself. Like it's the same category, but unless this cookie actually sells that many by itself would be wildly impressive. Mm -hmm. But it was actually really hard to find this information. But I did find it on, um, so I cross-checked candyretailer.com and southfloridareporter.com. And this is as of February of 2023. The number one selling cookie in America is, do you want to guess? Uh, I'm going to say Oreo. You are correct. Yes. The <laughs> Oreo um, makes... 675 million annually owned by nabisco and um based on the description this is the regular oreo not even like the other flavors or anything like that because like there's like a thousand different flavors of like oreo but then Turkey this is just lamb. like the regular <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> brisket a brisket oreo <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> number two chips ahoy grosses 620 million a year and i kind of just thought that this combined all all assorted flavors but because of the oreo how it's saying like it's just the original oreo this just mu must be the original Ch chips ahoy chocolate chip it's not like the m&m chip ahoy or the yeah. butter, peanut butter ones or whatever yeah uh, number three, Belvita cookies. I find that very hard to believe, but going on. <laughs> um, number four, double stuffed Oreos. And that's where I was like, really? Like, like are they really separate? Like, it's kind of yeah. crazy. Like, I, I'm a double stuffed fan. Like, I only get du double stuffed. If my wife br bring a, brings home regular Oreos, I am visually and audibly disappointed for the longest time i thought double stuff were the regular i thought they just said oh we're double stuffed uh like that was a motto but like they're two different like they're supposed to be two different cookies but i never see yeah. the regular ones it's always the double stuff when you get double stuff for a really long time and then you switch to original it is wildly disappointing <laughs> I'm so <laughs> let down by this. <laughs> this goddamn cookie ruined my day. <laughs> well, double stuffed Oreos grosses $250 million a year. And number five, the Fig Newton. Which, again, I find very hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, it couldn't confirm how much the, the this website, it didn't, it gave annual income for all the other cookies but it couldn't do it for this one um all it could say is that it sells over a billion cookies or a billion cookies consumed each year and according to statista.com in 2020 a survey showed that 14.77 million consumers had one to three packages of newton's all the time in their in their pantry within a 30-day period hmm. again i find this very hard to believe nobody ever talks about newtons <laughs> nobody ever says hey we're going to a party better pick me up some newtons you bringing the newtons <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I got to, you know what? I'm meal prepping my lunches for work for, for, for the whole week. Better pack some Newtons. <laughs> forgot the Newtons today. <laughs> oh, you forgot your like, Newtons. <laughs> like, nobody, like, <laughs> said no one ever. <laughs> like, what was the last time you had a Fig Newton? It's been years. Like, every now and then I see them at the stores. And I'm like, that looks like something I might like. I want to try it again. I try and go, it's not bad, but it's not something I really like and then like a few years go by and i see it i go i think i want to try that again okay it 
uh, quenched my thirst for another couple of years. Uh, I don't see it being number five on the cookie list. I I, <laughs> I under I understand Oreo and I understand Chips Ahoy. Everything else on those lists was like, I don't see it. Or is it just because it's Nabisco? I mean, how is I mean, would you call? I mean, if you can call an Oreo a cookie, you can call a Nutter Butter a cookie too. Why is it yeah. Nutter Butter on there? Like, wouldn't that be more popular? Like, like. Please, God, everybody comment below. Email <laughs> us, comment below. What's your favorite cookie? Your national cookie. brand. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to say national brand because you can't say your local shop because that doesn't, like, yeah. that's not going to, that's not going to win. That's <laughs> I odd. mean, obvi it's obviously better, but it's like, you got to think most popular cookie in the country. Uh, I'll say Pepperidge Farms is acceptable though. Yes, that is it's, a national brand. Yeah. They're the Brussels and the Milanos are superb. I guess they just don't sell as many of those. Yeah. The sal sal Salsalito. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us know what your go-to cookie is. What's your go-to national brand cookie? We all know mine. Double stuffed Oreos. And if it's not double stuffed Oreos, I will say specific flavor birthday cake Oreos. I think uh, I think I like Chips Ahoy more than Oreos. Uh, I, I go through phases, uh, but a good solid crunchy chocolate chip cookie is. Uh... I definitely had a huge romantic love with the chewy Ch Chips Ahoy for a very long time. <laughs> it was a passionate love affair. And then we grew apart. <laughs> you learned. And then I found double stuffed Oreos. <laughs> and then I was whisked away by the double stuffed. <laughs> they stuffed my heart full of <laughs> he had cholesterol. I'm not doing well. <laughs> I will die happy. <laughs> embraced in that <laughs> wedged between two cookies <laughs> that's what i want my coffin to be two giant cookies. <laughs> bunch of cream and me in the middle <laughs> oreos um, are solid i eat a lot of cookies and i still find myself going back to oreos pretty often they are solid uh yeah and i love them in ice cream uh oreo blizzards. oh my god uh, fantastic so then, this is how much of a fatty i am so, <laughs> so what i do with it <laughs> oh my god can't believe i'm gonna admit this uh you get the double stuffed oreo you know how you twist it and break it apart and then you eat uh, them and everything like that yeah. what i do is i eat the frosting side and then i throw the other cookie into a pile <laughs> and then i take that <laughs> And I crush it up and put it over ice cream. <laughs> this ice cream isn't fat free. It's fatty, fat, fat Oreo. <laughs> Somewhere out there, my doctor just shit himself. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I do. Okay. <laughs> right. Anything more on cookies? <laughs> nope. I think I've uh, embarrassed myself enough. <laughs> We all have our shames. <laughs> <laughs> no need to feel bad. We, we all do things. Uh, we all have our vices. <laughs> this is a judgment-free zone. Uh, the internet is obviously a judgment-free zone. Yeah, that's exactly what, that's what it is. <laughs> you have cookies? Coco had nipples? <laughs> we all have something. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Penny starts to write stuff down, and Sheldon says not to. Sheldon asks uh, if she's suffered a recent blow to the head. She says that's kind of mean, and so he repeats it while smiling. <laughs> she's received a blow to the head? Um, she says, no, he just sucks at teaching. Uh, she claims he's going too fast and asks for him to back up a little bit. So he starts from the very beginning. So you are looking up at the night sky. Um, he asks where she gets lost. Uh, and she goes, she say, I'm not sure. Where did you say I was looking up at the night sky? He goes, Grace, damn it. So she was lost from the very beginning. Yep. Um, 
she starts to cry because she feels stupid and he says that that's not a reason to cry you cry because you're sad for instance he cries because everybody else is stupid and that <laughs> makes him sad <laughs> so, so i guess that's the reason to cry um yeah <laughs> and she goes uh she just wants to be able to have him explain leonard's experiment that's going to be enough and so he breaks it down and says that leonard's trying to explain uh, figure out why subatomic particles move the way they do and that uh, doesn't sound so complicated and Sheldon says it's not complicated which is why Leonard's doing it uh, throwing Dick. it under the bus again and Penny has to stop and ask what are subatomic particles uh, we are back at the lab Howard walks in and is mad at Leonard because Leonard text blocked him blocked blocked him blocked it uh, whatever blockaded uh, blockaded <laughs> he blockaded him uh howard says that uh he's not leonard should have told uh bernadette what was going on uh something else yeah what else he should have said something else that made howard look uh less jealous and like a less of a jealous petty douche there we go and Bernadette comes in and asks what Howard's doing there. He's there to see the experiment. And she says uh, he thought the experiment was stupid. And Howard says, uh, no, I was just repeating what Sheldon said, although they all kind of said it. Uh, Howard starts talking about the issue. Leonard asks if he should go, but Bernadette says no. And he goes, good, because I wasn't going to leave anyways, like Raj did earlier in the show. Uh, Howard says he knows he seems really competent and worldly, but the truth is he feels threatened easily. Uh, and Leonard points out, what do I have? Leonard points out things Howard is afraid of and mentions that Howard once got a panic attack from getting his head stuck in a sweater. But technically, it was a turtleneck, as if that makes it okay. Although, I could kind of see myself panicking, too. Uh, if you get, actually do get stuck, yeah, it's like, like how do I get this off? Do. Am I have to, am I have to saw it off? <laughs> like, I remember there's an episode of Full House where uh, DJ is uh, babysitting, and the kid puts his head through uh, <clears throat> the banister. Yeah, like, I remember. I'd probably yeah. lose my shit if I was that kid. I'd be like, oh, I can't get out. Uh, yeah. And then, I thought she had a good solution she like butters up the kid but yeah it was to, butter yeah, yeah. And well then, it wasn't uh, dj she had to call like uncle jesse or someone like her, her uh, dad I think she called she called her dad but he brings a saw in and cuts it open i'm like that seems kind of uh overkill for getting like oh we're just gonna saw the whole fucking staircase down but no nah, weird i was gonna suggest song his ears off yeah because I'm a repl, because I'm a replicant, <laughs> and you don't need your ears, do you, replicant? <laughs> so uh, Howard asks if there's any chance that she will forgive him, and she asks Leonard, and he says not to ask her him because he called his project stupid. And so Bernadette does forgive Howard and says, "Come here, Tushy Face," much like his mom calls him, Tushy Face. And Leonard picks up on the term of endearment and says that's going to twitter so we are closing up we are at the apartment and bernadette talks about how cool the experiment was uh, leonard says he's glad she enjoyed it because most people aren't interested at all and penny and sheldon share a look uh so because she's able to talk and she says Given the, I, I wrote this down like word for word, given the parameters of his experiment, the transport of electrons through the aperture of the nano fabricated metal rings is qualitatively no different than the experiment already conducted in the Netherlands. Uh, their observed phase shift in the diffusing electrons inside the metal ring already conclusively demonstrate the electric analog of the Arahanov bomb quantum interference effect. So that's a lot that we, I don't understand. I'm not sure if she <laughs> did, but she said it very uh, and he nods. And she says, that's it. That's all she knows. And also Fig Newton's name came from the town, <laughs> not a scientist. <laughs> I also want to point out that I, I caught Sheldon's uh, shirt and I don't know why it caught my attention, but I'm like, I think that has something to do with uh, Green Lantern. And I looked it up and apparently his shirt in that scene is the Violet, Violet Lantern Corps which is from the Green Lantern um, 
section of DC, I guess. And apparently, a little bit about, I had never really heard of them, but uh, the Violet Lantern Corps are usually allies with the Green Lanterns, and their color and rings are charged by the emotion of love. Which is kind of like double stuffed air Oreos. Hell yeah! <laughs> so I thought I was going to share that. And then we are at the end of the episode. Uh, all we have left is the vanity card. We did it! Another Woo-hoo. episode down. So we got a and it's a nice card. <laughs> ah, suck it, suck it, suck Brian. Oh, <laughs> damn you, replicants! <laughs> All right, so this one says, Chuck Lorre Productions, number 270. Jillian had a urinary tract infection again. That sentence appeared in my mind a few days ago, just as you see it above. I have no idea what it means other than the obvious, and I don't know anyone named Jillian. Regardless, I thought it'd be interesting to begin a vanity card with it and just see where it goes. Jillian had a urinary tract infection again. Her doctor liked to abbreviate the condition to UTI. She liked to abbreviate it to TMH, too much humping. Regardless, the road back to the vaginal happiness, to vaginal happiness, was always the same. Cranberry juice and abstinence. Thankfully, her boyfriend Dudley was always very understanding. He just smile, hold her in his arms and say, well, babe, when one door closes, another one opens up. Um, she'd always giggle and blush when he'd say that, uh, but deep down she'd wish she had the courage to cover his mouth and nose with the chloroform soaked rag and then, while he was unconscious, snip off his testicles with little scissors she used to groom her schnauzer. All of which explains why the next sentence popped into my head recently nobody sang bg songs on karaoke night like deadly so i was so actually that got like, weird it got <laughs> weird uh i was laughing at the when one door closes and now there opens up not because of the context or his meaning but because of the meme i saw relating that to boeing so yep. <laughs> <laughs> which we were talking about earlier so yeah today. but that's the vanity card we did it that got weird quickly yeah, I think um do you ever do this as like a writer because like you you you're an English teacher. Do you do writing exercises like this where you have like a line pop in your head and you kind of just start writing and just to see where it goes? Do you ever do sometimes? Like that? Sometimes like I'll get a line and I'll write it down like in a notebook and I'll just like kind of use it as a jump start on a story or something. I may or may not use it. Use that line, uh but it's kind of like what's going on in this world why did this line come to be uh so sometimes does it usually lead to castration every single time <laughs> oddly enough i have a whole book about castration <laughs> I, I was just surprised chuck Lorre did too no. it's like we're soulmates <laughs> or we're both replicants <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right uh let's count some iq points so the points only one point this episode and it was for being like Howard so 81 points not like Sheldon 83 like Sheldon I think I got six but I'm gonna recount it and we have six IQ points well this turned out to be a very fun episode yeah (laughs) I I I enjoyed this one um I love that Penny is trying to like be the good girlfriend and kind of understand leonard's world because i'm sure she notices that like leonard kind of bends over backwards to kind of know her and like be involved in her life and everything like that so it's good for her to kind of flip it around and learn more about him and she's then caring and interesting. Yeah. yeah yeah and i love the howard growth too like every episode ever since he met Ber- bernadette you see a little bit more growth mm-hmm. more and more so it's like he he got vulnerable w- w- with her about like I know I come across as like this worldly person and I'm cool <laughs> and everything, but I'm really not. And it's a really big thing. It's a very humbling experience to kind of have that moment. 
and her pointing out that uh, he says things that he's just trying to be funny, like uh, accepting him for that and him realizing, like, uh, that's not necessarily how I have to act or come off. Uh, that Although he is trying to be funny, it's just that he doesn't have to be offensive necessarily. Well, he doesn't always, I guess it's like he's trying to, like, and I get it, like, there are times like he's not the tallest guy in the world. He's not the best looking guy. He's not the smartest guy. So what is his niche? His niche is that he's the funny guy. So mm-hmm. he feels like he always has to kind of turn it on. Like Be that's like, that's how I bring value t- to the group and to, into social si- situations. But then maybe if he just brought some yeah. Newtons with him, that's all he needs. <laughs> or some of his mom's lamb stew. Seriously. I want some lamb stew now. Damn. Someone brought me a lamb stew. I'd be like, Thank you, "That's Jesus. weird," but <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'm gonna eat it. But... I'm gonna take it home and boil the shit out of it just to make sure you didn't poison it. <laughs> but then I'll eat it, <laughs> replicant style. Oh my <laughs> fatty fat, fat ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so hard on that ice cream. <laughs> Well, anything else to add to this episode? That's all I got. I'm looking forward to the Christmas episode next. All right. (laughs) Me too. Well, thanks again for listening. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Theoretical Nonsense Pod. Email us at theoreticalnonsensepod at gmail.com. And we will see you next time when when we are on the Christmas episode. (laughs) Season 3, Episode 11, The Maternal Congruence. See you next time. This was Theoretical Nonsense, the Big Bang Theory Watch Along Podcast. No PhD required. Our intro and outro music is by Alex Kroll. Thanks for listening. I want to see some lamb feet now.